Hello, welcome and thank you for joining us um, for this webinar, uh, Crop Protection Update for Narcissus. I hope you can all hear me okay. I'm Natalie Key, a Knowledge Exchange Manager for AHDB Horticulture. Um, and before we kick off, I just want to run through some housekeeping elements and also um, the order of play. So for information throughout the webinar, the audience is muted but you can ask questions by submitting them through the questions box, which should be on the right-hand side um, of your screen in the panel. There'll be opportunities to ask questions after each session and at the end, um, ideally, please indicate who your question is for and I'll read them aloud during um, those allotted question times. Any questions that we don't uh, get to will be saved and will, will be answered after the webinar. Similarly, if you have any questions after the webinar's finished, please email them to me on natalie.key at ahdb.org.uk uh, by the end of the week, and we'll do our best to answer those as well. The webinar will be recorded, so if you need to catch up on anything, um, you can watch it again on our AHDB webinars archive. Um, if you have any problems during the webinar um, that you can't highlight to us via the questions box, please also email me as I'll be keeping an eye on my inbox. Basis and Enroso um, points are available for this webinar, so com please complete the forms um, which you can download from the handout section on the right hand side and email them to Maya, whose email is um, on the list, on, listed on the form. So, um, just to run through order of play, first of all, we'll hear from Dave Kay from ADAS, who's going to talk about such plus trials carried out. Um, identifying alternative actives for white mould and smolder. Then um, we'll pass over to Angela Huckle from ADAS as well, who will be discussing the Septa Plus trials looking into active options for weed control. Then um, John Clarkson from Warwick Crop Centre will talk about his work looking into the control of fusarium basal rot. And finally, AHDB's Joe McTighe will provide a crop protection update on the latest approvals and information on EMUs for Narcissus. We'll do our best to keep to time, so hopefully we should be all wrapped up by 1.45pm. Um, for information as well, we're hosting another webinar this Thursday, the 12th of November at 12.30, which will cover the outcomes of the work trialling chlorine dioxide in hot water treatment to help re reduce levels of fusarium. So please register or for that one via our events page, or there's a direct link um, on the attached program, which you can register via as well. So um, I will now pass over to Dave to start us off. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Natalie. Right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, oops. My name is Dave Kay and I am a plant pathologist with RSK ADAS Limited, part of horticulture. And today I'm here to talk to you about the SEPTA Plus program and um, specifically looking at the control of white mold and smolder in this cysis. So before I um, talk about the projects, I thought I, for those of you who aren't familiar with the SEPTA Plus program, you might benefit from knowing more about it. So um, it's a four-year program which is concluding um, this year or, or next year and is follow-on to the original SEPT program which was managed by the HDB in 2010 to 2014 and it's got four main aims um, firstly to develop solutions to emerging crop protection issues secondly to reduce adverse environmental impacts on crop protection products thirdly to reduce supply chain vulnerability and fourth to accelerate testing process and bring your products to market. And this fourth point is really where my work is involved and also the work Angela will be talking about later on. So because there's this common diseases, white mold and smolder, um, we're looking to test actives which are already authorized for use in horticulture, but in other sectors, which we expect to be um, effective against white mold and smolder, test those um, in Narcissus and that provides information and evidence to support an EAMU which would allow hopefully that product to be used in Narcissus production. 
So there's two targets, as I mentioned, white mold, ramularia, vallis and brosi, and smolder, botryotinia, narcissicola. And as you're aware as narcissus growers or anyone really within the horticultural or, or arable industry, I suppose, that the number of available actives is in decline. And this um, puts pressure on what we've got left, especially with a resistance point of view. So it's important that we identify alternatives which are effective, crop safe, and also safe to the um, crop workers, in this case, because it's a hand-picked crop, and also safe to the consumer. So in 2019, we established a trial looking at the efficacy of several products. And then this year, we looked at those products in commercial programs to identify the best program um, that can be used. So I'll start off by discussing the year one work, and then I'll discuss year two. So in year one, we selected um, nine products. Well. It was under an untreated control so, uh, with tracker as the standard. You can see the products are listed there as AHDB coded products. If we could share that information with you, what they actually correspond to, we would, um, but we can't, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, but what we did was we took these products, which we suspected to have efficacy against white mold and smolder, and we applied them every 10 to four days as a straight repeating pattern four times. It's not something you would do normally, but it's a good robust way of checking efficacy and also it's a good way of checking crop safety. Um, with regards to efficacy, um, all the products we tested, apart from AHDB 9873, reduced the severity of white mold by the final assessment, and all products significantly reduced the severity of smolder by the final assessment. And this is a really positive outcome. Not all trials work as well as this one, so it was a pleasure to do. Um, and a lot of excellent products were identified. In addition to the good efficacy, we also saw that there was no crop safety aspects or concerns with the products that we were tested. These are just visual representations of that um, of that data I just described to you. So you can see Tracker, the industry standard, performed very well um, against the control where white mold severity was reduced from about 7.1 to about 1.1. And you can see that all green bars represent significant reductions in disease severity, white mold severity, compared with the untreated. Um, 9914, 9913, and 9926 all did very well. Um, and these all have an SDHI component, which um, Tracker has. So it's unsurprising that they've done well. But the other products, which have also um, given effective control, had many different actives, including 9871, which had a biological product. Um, it's, a, it's a microbial product. And that's really promising because it shows that um, bi biology, biological control, has a place in field based. Um, crop protection and um, and that we shouldn't shy away from it because biolog biology will be the future hand in hand with conventional chemistry control. Similar issue with smolder, you can see that all the products um, are green and they all gave a significant level of control against um, smolder severity at the final assessment. So with the really positive results from year one, we wanted to take these forwards to program design at year two. So we carried on using the same Narcissus variety, St. Patrick's Day, and we actually placed this trial right next door to the trial from 2019. And the reason for this was because we'd had such good results there, and we knew that we would most likely get a high level of disease based on what we got last year. And also because um, these diseases tend to accumulate in um, the soil or the trash over time, it does mean that a third year down crop would have a greater chance of having a, a greater disease level than we had the previous year. So it was cited at JH Richards and Son, so thank you Andrew and, and everyone there um, for hosting and for all your assistance. And the plot size was a good seven and a half meters squared, which means you've got enough bulbs for, um, for good robust science there. Again, we had 10 treatment programs rather than 10 individual treatments and we had four treatment applications, the same as the year before, with four replicates. And then we assessed it five times from the end of January to the end of April, 
And as I mentioned before, this was reliant on natural um, occurring infection. This is a um, slide of the treatment programs we used. So the tracker, um, sort of industry standard, sorry, in, which includes tracker was based on a program um, which was designed or requested by to agronomists to provide us with that. And then the others, um, three to 10, were based on FRAC guidance, uh, based on the um, actives of the chemistry, of the products that we were using. And you can see at the bottom, a list of the many different modes of actions that we were using in this, because we can't just rely on one, we have to test several. And if I could just draw your attention to programs nine and 10, um, you'll see that's 9871, which if you can remember is the biological product that we trialed last year. And it was of interest to trial it at different times. So with, in this example for nine, we've tried it at spray two and spray four. And for program 10, it was at spray two and spray three. So to try and identify the best time to use these biological products um, as part of an IPM um, program. Moving on to results, um, white mold and smolder developed from naturally occurring sources of infection as we expected them to do. However, unfortunately, no differences developed in white mold or smolder incidence compared with the untreated control over the course of the, of the trial. Um, and this is because disease levels were lower, unfortunately, and surprisingly. An average disease severity score at the final assessment in the untreated in the white mold was 8.7% and in the smolder um, it was 6.7%. And as, an, as a comparison, last year in the smolder, the level of disease in the untreated was 27%. So we saw significantly less disease this year. Moving on to the results, there's a lot of um, data here, but please don't worry about the table. It's really the color of the cells that you have to worry about. Um, where a cell is blue, there is no difference compared with the untreated control. And if it's a pinky salmon color, if you can see that, that's when you're seeing significant differences. So also with white mold severity, unfortunately, we didn't see any disease, any significant differences between um, the untreated and treatment programs. Um, however, if we look at smolder, you can see that we did see significant differences, but only at the third assessment. So on the 27th of March, almost all products re significantly reduced the small severity of smolder on the plants compared with the untreated control, which in this case was um, at 9.18%. And I can show that to you a bit easier graphically in this chart. And unsurprisingly, the standard program performed well. Um, HDB9913 didn't perform well this time, which is interesting, um, but all other products did. And I've highlighted at the end with the stars, the biological control programs, and you can see that's 9871 at timing two and four, and 9871 at timings two and three. I think because we only got limited um, positive results from this trial, it's difficult to establish if one of those programs is better than the other. And um, what I would like to do is repeat this trial if possible, hoping to get higher disease um, conditions so that we can see some real strong differences in order to fully evaluate these programs. But ultimately we know from the year one work that a lot of the products that we tested were um, effective and also crop safe. So um, we've already got some fantastic results, even if um, the results from this year haven't been as um, good as we'd hoped. So in conclusion, um, the products tested in this project um, during last year reduced the incidence and severity of both white mold and smolder. And the promising products were taken forwards to this year to identify um, the most appropriate ones for use in a commercial program. Disease pressure was low, and that meant that we didn't see any significant control or differences in white mold control or smolder incidents, but we did see some differences with um, smolder severity, um, apart from 98, uh, sorry, 9913. And also again, that biological product 9871 worked well. It performed, um, it performed well and it reaffirms its 
potential for use as a component of an IPM program. And it, you know, that will represent um, the future where we're probably heading. And again, no phytotoxicity of commercial concern developed in any program at any assessment date. And that also confirms what we saw um, in the year one of this work. Finally, just to acknowledge um, HV Horticulture, of course, for, for funding the work, JH Richards and Sons for all their help. Um, you know, they went above and beyond. And the AdChem companies who also not just supplied the SEPTA projects, but they also um, they also finance them in part. And then Alice Shrewsbury um, from our ADA site in Devon. With the coronavirus pandemic, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to Cornwall this year, but Alice um, just managed the trial fantastically well. Any questions? Thank you, Dave. Um, yes, if anyone has any questions, please um, please submit them via the questions box. Um, one is, um, are there any plans and pipelines for future trials? Do you know? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that, Natalie. Are there future plans for further trials? At um, the moment? Not not to my knowledge i think i'm not sure quite what's happening with set at the moment i think next year might be carry on from projects which weren't able to be done potentially this year i would like to carry it on um but that is up to the hdb uh, and not myself but if you have ideas for stuff if you want doing or you want this carried on you you can speak to the hdb if, if it's something that you'd like to see done um uh, question here is could the weather in year two have impacted on the results and um, similarly another question is along those lines is what do you attribute um, that the low the low disease incidence to um it's it's a it's a it yeah it's frustrating and um it's almost there's almost like a disease pressure within the field as well because this trial was situated just to the left of last year's trial and on the right hand side closer to where last year's trial was the disease levels were slightly higher as well interestingly but yeah the weather will have um will have played a role certainly of environmental conditions um this year because the smolder especially was about just under a third of what it was last year um unfortunately this is um some, sometimes how these things happen yeah um i think that's oh, no, another question's just come in. Um, how close are we to getting an emu through for any of these products? Something I think Joe will be. Yeah. I think Joe, Joe McClike later on will hopefully be able to provide some clarity on that. Um, so, so I'll ask that question again when we get there. Okay. Um, some of these look to have performed well in the trials over the two years. When can we start to see some of the details products yet? Similarly, that's gonna come through from Joe, um, hopefully towards the end of this webinar. So, um, so stay tuned for that. Um, thank you very much, Dave. I think I don't see any further questions coming in. So um, I'll hand over to John. Okay, hopefully, can you see the slides okay and hear me okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. So I'm John Clarkson from the Warwick Crop Centre uh, School of Life Sciences, University of Warwick. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Fusarium basal rot uh, in Narcissus. Okay, so just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about. So primarily, I'm going to show you some results from uh, the SEPTA Plus project, which was testing crop protection products for control of fusarium. And uh, Dave has already given uh, an excellent introduction to the uh, SEPTA Plus program. Um, I am going to briefly mention Rob Lillywhite's, Rob Lillywhite's work um, that was mentioned earlier, uh, just to give you a flavour of that. So that's the potential of biocides for control of fusarium with a focus on chlorine dioxide. And finally, I'm going to say something about some related work we're doing in another HDB project where we're, amongst other things, we're developing molecular diagnostics for a range of Fusarium um, oxysporum former specialis across multiple crops. 
Okay, so just to remind everybody of what we're talking about. So a pathogen is Fusarium oxysporum. It's a globally distributed soil-borne fungal plant pathogen, and it causes vascular wilts and root rots, and of course, in the case of Narcissus, a bulb rot. And as you can see from the picture there, um, a very wide range of different host crops are affected. Those are just the ones that, that we've worked on either in the past or currently working on. Uh, but there's a much wider range. There's maybe um, uh, more than 120 different crops that, that are affected by uh, Fusarium oxysporum. Um, the key thing to remember about this pathogen that it is actually a species complex. So they're all one species, Fusarium oxysporum, but within that complex you've got what's called these former species, these, these special forms, and each of those is individually uniquely adapted to a particular host. So this does mean, for instance, that the Fusarium oxysporum that affects Narcissus uh, will not affect onion, for instance, or, or vice versa. So they are very specific. There's a number of challenges um, when we're, we're thinking about control. Uh, firstly, in terms of resistance, um, races of Fusarium oxysporum can emerge um, in response to uh, resistance being deployed. Now in Narcissus, there could be some evidence that that has been the case in the past because St. Uh, Kevin uh, was previously thought to be resistant, but we certainly found Fusarium in that variety. The other key challenge is it uh, produces these chlamydospores, these long-lived spores that can survive for many years in soil. So once you've got the problem, it's very difficult to get rid of it. And uh, finally, the other thing to mention is that within this species complex, we have non-pathogenic Fusarium oxysporums, and you can find these in all soils. And in fact, some of them are beneficial, and one's even been developed as a biological control agent. So that does represent a challenge to the scientists, for instance, for identification. Okay, so when we focus on Fusarium oxysporum former specialis narcissi, I'm going to call that FOM, if it was a bit easier. Um, that's the particular one that affects narcissus and causes the basal rot um, that you'll all be, I guess, familiar with. Um, there are there is some differences in susceptibility um, of different narcissus varieties although that hasn't been explored recently but we do know for instance that widely grown varieties such as Carl carlton and golden harvest are particularly susceptible and as i mentioned previously saint cavern has uh, shown to exhibit some resistance in the past but again uh, just to say that we have found fusarium in in that variety so for control the industry is very dependent on the use of fungicides which are added during the hot water treatment um, to con uh, for control of basal rot and of course the hot water treatment is primarily at least historically aimed at uh, control of stem nematode so um, it's worth just considering what the hot water treatment is doing in the context of fusarium so as I say, it's been used for many years to control stem nematode. But the problem is, is that hot water treatment actually can promote Fusarium basal rot. So this is the real problem. And there's a number of ways that uh, I think, uh, you know, this happens. So firstly, it can spread spores from infected to healthy bulbs when you, you've got a big tank. Um, the hot water treatment could allow germination of spores that have become adhered to the basal plate in the field. So you're wetting up, um, you're wetting up, wetting up the bulb, and that gives good conditions for infection. And also, because you're warming the bulbs and again providing moisture, this can enhance the disease development in those bulbs that might have had a bit of latent fusarium already. Um, so, really, you know hot water treatment is quite a good way of, of firstly spreading fusarium and also um, enhancing it in your bulb stock and therefore as this is why i put it in bulb it's essential that you you include fungicides or biocides um, into your hot water treatment um, unless you're particularly confident that that you may have a completely uh, clean bulb stock but in my uh, certainly in my experience these are very hard to come across Okay, so the current situation um, in terms of fungicides for use in, in hot water treatment 
So historically, of course, we had thiobendazole, astorite, ortezate, and chlorothalonil as Bravo. Those were the industry standards and, and they worked very well, but unfortunately they've both now been withdrawn. So we did some work um, a number of years ago, uh, back in 2014 in HDB BOF74 projects, and we showed that tebiconazole, azorius, and prochloraz as Mirage gave good control of fusarium basal rot. In fact, they were, they were better, or at least equal to uh, storite or bravo. <clears throat> so at this point, um, in terms of emus then, um, HDB began to pro progress an emu for prochloraz, but that was initially rejected, but I believe, and we'll hear more from Joe later, that it's still being pursued by AHDB. Um, they didn't pursue an emu for tebiconazole because that was on the way out to being withdrawn anyway. Since then, um, an emu has been granted for switch, so Dave mentioned this product um, early on, uh, ciprodonil and fludoxanil. Um, but we never actually tested it uh, against Fusarium, so um, this Sector Plus project uh, um, allowed us to do that. So what did we do in the project? Well, we, we obtained a Fusarium-free bulb stock um, and we obviously hot water treated it with, with and without the uh, test products. And you can see this small um, experimental system uh, we have on the right hand side, it's good for these sort of small numbers of bulbs. We then uh, planted the treated bulbs in um, infested growing medium. And then, so this was in pots and we put these in a, a frost-free glass house. And then the, the following year, we, we monitored any foliar symptoms and obviously assessed the bulbs for fusarium. In terms of products we evalu evaluated, firstly, um, thiobendazole. Now, interestingly, Storite Excel, which is a slightly different product, um, is still approved for potatoes. So we were asked to, to test that. So we were probably confident that we'd have some activity from this product. We retested Prochloraz as Mirage Alain uh, to, if you like, confirm our previous results. And importantly, during this um, experiment, we were also collecting data on the amount of product um, that was taken up by the bulbs, which may help um, progress an emu. And again, Joe might have more to say later. So that might be quite useful uh, for approval of prochloraz. We then included switch as well, as that's, that's got an emu. And then we also had three chemical fungicides and three microbial biopesticides, and those were coded products. So um, interestingly, the microbial biopesticides, you might think that was a bit puzzling to select those, but we did to check that they were thermally stable. So these microbial products all survived the hot water treatment at 44.4 for three and a half hours. This is a table to show the rates of products. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but just to say that the rate of thiobendazole was as approved for potatoes. Um, the switch uh, was as per the emu and the Mirage Alain was as per a, a Dutch label. And you can see that some pictures of the trial on the right hand side uh, at different stages. Uh, the, the, the final products in that table are the biological ones um, and the chemical fungicides that we use, the coded ones, uh, the rates were based on the maximum allowable per hectare. So uh, moving on to the results, they were very clear actually and here you can see a graph. This shows you the percentage bulbs um, with fusarium. And you can see here that Storite, Excel, uh, Mirage, Alain, and a coded product, which is a chemical fungicide, HDB9819, um, reduce the amount of bulbs, uh, instance of bulbs with fusarium um, significantly. So right down to, to levels of between 10 and, and 30 odd percent. Uh, compared to uh, an untreated um, where we had around more than 90% fusarium. And you can see some pictures, um, an effective treatment on the top on the right hand side and obviously the control uh, in the bottom picture. Similarly, when we looked at severity, so this is the amount of browning, if you like, in that bulb, we get a similar result. So, you know, the take home message from this, this work is that Storite Excel works, Mirage Elan also effective as well as this other coded uh, chemical fungicide. 
just to mention briefly Rob Lily like Lily White's work um, where he was looking at different biocides as well as heat treatments for for control of fusarium in hot water treatment and we were involved in this work also at the beginning um, the graph on the right hand side there just shows you that chlorine dioxide is is quite effective at 5 ppm levels and 10 ppm levels so here you can see uh, the number of bowls with low severity of basal rot is increased compared to uh, an untreated. Um, he also tested this biocide in the presence of soil because we know a number of biocides um, lose their activity quite quickly and to a certain extent fungicides as well if there's a lot of soil or organic matter in the tanks. We also showed that actually heat treatment, so 60 degrees for more than five minutes also kills fusarium spores and Rob had also explored that as an option. So um, you'll hear more about that um, from, uh, from Rob in, in another time. And finally I'd just like to say something about this other project then um, where we're looking at fusarium across multiple crops and there's more of a focus here on fusarium in onion. But what we have done in the context of Narcissus is develop a molecular qPCR test um, which is specific um, to the fusarium that causes problems in, in Narcissus. Um, and we've used this um, just in a preliminary way. We can detect the pathogen in soil samples uh, from a field with high levels of basal rot. And in the table on the right hand side there, you can see a number of different field samples, also bulb samples where we've employed this test. And the right hand side column there, um, basically the um, smaller the number in this case, just to confuse you, uh, shows you high levels of, of the pathogen. But I've, I've sort of indicated with the traffic light system there, those reddish boxes show high levels of the pathogen, yellow intermediate, and then we've got some negative um, readings as well for, for bulbs that, that had no visible symptoms. So, you know, we are hoping that we could deploy at some point in the future this test to actually put it, for instance, do some soil tests to see what the levels of fusarium might be. Now, in order to, for this to be effective, uh, one thing we have done is actually try and understand how many fusarium spores do you need in soil um, to actually cause disease. So this is an experiment um, we did uh, again in the glasshouse. And you can see on the x-axis on these graphs, increasing numbers of fusarium spores. And the top graph shows the percentage of bowls with fusarium and the bottom graph, basal rot severity. And you can see a dose response there. And actually you need quite high levels of fusarium spores to cause disease. So the next step is to relate our molecular test then to, to this kind of data. So if we do get a result with a molecular test, we can make some sort of assessment on, you know, um, whether whether that's likely to result in disease. So that's that's all for me. Just just to say thanks to uh, the people involved, Sasha, Alison, and Andy. Um, so seen here in happier times when we're allowed to get a bit closer together. And thank you to the AHDB, of course, for for all their funding. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Um, and first stepping in a little bit early. Um, yeah, similarly to before, if anyone has any questions, please submit them. Um, had some similar inquiries about um, when products are going to be, you know, we're going to be able to use products on site anytime soon. So obviously, hopefully, Joe will be able to find, uh, provide some clarity on that. Um, any questions from anyone else? Clearly, you covered everything. <laughs> okay, well, I guess there's a chance at the end if anybody thinks of anything. Absolutely, yeah. We'll have a, we'll see if any questions pop up in the meantime. Um, what we're going to do is have a go at um, getting Angela with us via a different method. Um, and if that, oh, there's one question actually, John, just whilst we're here. Um, was there a reason why botanical fungicides were not included? Um, was there a reason? Um, they were they were considered at, at the time. The, the problem was that we were limited in the number of treatments we could test. You probably saw the size of the glasshouse that we had there. And as usual in the Scepter Plus 
projects um you know we we did have some discussions or hdb had some discussions with growers and so the the, the final product list was drawn up <clears throat> you know following that and following advice from uh, joe's team is the is the answer to that one um there's no reason why in the future if there's products which we think might have some activity against we why we couldn't why we couldn't test those uh, but obviously as dave says you know the sector plus project will be coming to an end next year uh, and not aware of any spare money for any new trials to to start up other than what's already on the books as it were yeah thank you very much john um, I will, so I'm going to try presenting and uh, Angela's dialed in, so hopefully this will work, but bear with us for a moment, please. Hello. Hi, Angela. Ah, did you hear that all right then? Yes, can you, can everyone see my screen okay? Okay, I mean, I can share mine because I think that should still work, then I can at least talk alongside things. Okay, I'll give that a go. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sorry, that's not more. Right. Um so I think I've probably got through the first couple of slides, so <coughs> pardon me. Um I'll skip over those I think and start back where we were with the uh, herbicides that we were looking at. So this was the dormant trial um, which was carried out over 2019-2020. Uh, um, so say we had metabromuron um, in with tank mixes of Senkor Explorer and Stop Aqua. This is uh, similar to Linuron but not the same as so I can see under here um, many of the same weeds are controlled but there are exceptions and as described in the sort of third slide um, things like small nettle with less activity as well as mayweed these are sort of increasingly um, starting to occur and become small problems in in the sort of narcissus crops so we've also got in here three other coded products and I can see highlighted in bold those um, those particular weeds which were identified as a gap which those products would then actually control. Um, so with this um, trial design um, what has happened was by the time of the first application at uh, the 21st of November not 2019, I think we all remember it's quite wet at the end of last year so finding a window to apply it, by that time 15 to 18 percent of the plots were covered by already emerged weed. So I took the decision uh, to apply glyphosate first before applying the treatment to give a uh, product such as 9987, which is a purely residual product, uh, a fair chance in the trial. Um, so we could have not applied the glyphosate to see what they did alone, but I think that's something perhaps to look at later on. And so we to give things a fair chance, we did put it on um, and then, um, so then so that's all the results, work on those results that we've got. So say the first application went on at the end of November 2019 um, and then two of the treatments we had a follow-up treatment pre-emergence of 9987 or GAMIT which was applied 20th of January 2020 um, and a good uh, positive out of the trial was there were no significant crop effects from any of the treatments on bud, bud numbers, bud emergence timings or flower quality and you can see to the right of the text says that this is a photo of the trial area taken about 10, 9, 10 days after that final application, the second one. Um, it's hard to see but right in the far far end of that trial there's a red flag in the distance and I think you can see across all of that trial area that's a very sort of even emergence with no effects there at all on any so there was no significant effects on any flower quality either from any of the treatments. There's some uh, positive uh, combinations to take from the trial. If we move on to the scent weed cover at 10 weeks after application, so on the top of the, look at the top of the screen, there's percent mean weed cover per plot shown. We had at 10 weeks after application, there's 25% weed cover in the untreated control. This has increased a little bit after this because we did another assessment later on. 
but you can see at this assessment um, all of the products and combinations giving a significant reduction in weed control. There was a significant difference in treatment. Um, this was only with HDB 9917, um, which is more of a grass weed um, uh, herbicide, so that's really for control of black grass. Um, so that's done significantly worse than all of the other ones, combinations of products in the trial. And so we, as I described in the earlier slide, we had also, as well as the coded product, tested products like wing pea, Nirvana and Hurricane. I am aware that the wing pea is the, the uh, authorised rate is 3.5 litres per hectare, not four. So we did actually pass, sorry, go ahead above what we should have done, but all have given good efficacy. And so to just briefly summarise that one, um, the weed species there were mainly shepherd's purse with some small nettle and mayweed. So what we're looking at is effects and the results on those particular weeds. And all of the products listed below were applied just after the life of the application. And so all of these below look at something useful that we could actually use to, at the timing now. So this is sort of a pertinent um, timing to do this webinar. So we've got Metabromiron or the coded product, tank mixed with either Fencorex Flow or Stomp Aqua as two-way or three-way tank mixes were actually safe and reduced weed levels to 1% cover for up to 10 weeks after application. Um, and depending on your um, weed species mix that you've got in the trials, uh, in, trials in your field, you've also got could choose Hurricane or Nirvana or Wing P as well as options to use at this timing. So in this particular trial, they proved safe. So I'd probably say test a small area first because it's only the first time I've seen them, but they were safe in this trial with no effects on flowers the next year. And then in the pipeline, we've got um, 9994, which was safe tank mixed with either Sencorex Flow, Stomp Pack, or Wing P, and will be worth pursuing an EV4. And um, further away, 9900 and 9822 are promising products, but they're a bit long distance away. If we move on to the post cropping trial, again we had the same coded products that we had in the um, dormant trial, but just picking them at different timings to so whether they're safe over the crop as well as in dormant timing. Um, and also, as with the dormant trial, uh, we looked at existing authorizations in tap mixes. So we had Wing P plus Lecter and Stomp Aqua plus Future Flow in this trial. The experimental treatments were applied on the 19th of March in 2019, and the photo below shows the trial at um, early March before the um, treatments were applied. So you can see that there was a good amount of weed there to sort of give them a good test, which was mainly Willow Herb and Shepherd's Purse. Um, once the experimental treatments are applied and the assessments are done, then as per standard practice, a dormant spray was applied in November 2019. So this was Roundup, then Stomp. And this trial was in Cornwall, where the previous one was in Lynx. Um, and then in early 2020, so earlier this year, then we've assessed the bud emergence and flower quality to look at whether there's any carryover effects. So if I um, move on to the, this is the crop safety scores, um, which were done back in 2019 after the first treatment was applied. So on the left axis, you've got 10 at the top, which is a very severe effect, or zero, which is nil effect on the crop. Now what you'll note is the untreated um, is actually scored three. This was because it was blind scored, and there were blotches from the hot water treatment, which um, the assessor sort of took as an effect on the crop. So when you're looking at this graph, so the red line, anything below that red line is actually crop safe. And what you're looking at, what we were looking at there, is a hot water treatment effect. So what I'll pick out in this is there's one coded product which had a very severe effect on the crop, which meant it had complete loss of turga about one to two weeks after application. It did recover, but this was very, very um, dramatic. Um, and then if we look at the other arrows, which aren't, aren't so thick, this highlights ones where it's six weeks after um, the application of these products. So Future Flow, those involved in Future Flow, 9994 and 990 over the crop. What happened here is these, these plots actually started to finesse earlier and drop down earlier than the other um, 
treatments and product combinations in this in this trial. So that's something to take into account whether those would actually be more appropriate and safer at a dormant timing than at the than at a post cropping timing. And then moving on to weed the effects of it, the efficacy of the weed uh, control. We had a good amount of weed in this. So on the left axis, you can see weeds per square meter. And in the untreated control, total weeds was 90 weeds per square meter, so quite a bit there. Um, and all of the products gave at least 50% weed control. Um, but what I wanted to highlight in this slide is the differences in the weed species controlled. Because while the wing pea treatments are clear of shepherd's purse, they've left behind the willow herb. Um, as a 9921, which wasn't safe, and 994 a little bit. Um, so that's, and if we look at this, the ones that control willow herb, you've got Curb, uh, 9990, and to some extent a little bit of 994, which controlled it early on, and Beach Blow. Um, but then if we move on to look at percent cover, this um, highlights that, that although the wing pea hadn't controlled, the willow herb, it was still there, what was left was small. Uh, and then when we had in the previous slide, you had the butaflow controlling the willow herb, the remaining weeds left behind are rather large, and so at this point in the cover, it doesn't actually give significant control. And you can see there's sort of 80% cover of weed cover in the plot, the untreated controls. So there was quite a number of weeds there. Um, the Single stars over the graph, so I bear significantly um, give significant difference to the untreated. And the actual, the ones with two stars are actually giving significant control compared to the curb stomp act for um, standard. So from this, you can see that we've got two or three different good treatments there. So wing people selector, been very good in this situation against shepherd's person will herb. Even that hasn't fully controlled the wheel herb, it's actually you know, controlled cover. And you've got 9865 and 9990. Oh. And even as an inter row, 990 actually is also giving good control. So although it's not safe over the top, it could be something that's applied into row. Um, so to summarize what I've just said, and it's, as we saw in that um, crop safety graph, all treatments except 9921 appear crop safe at four weeks post application. But so in the following year, we didn't actually see any um, effects on the uh, buds or the flower quality. Um, but over time, perhaps that early senescence is not a good thing. Um, plots treated with Bluetooth Flow 9994 or 9900 seem to group or senesce early at, at sort of six to ten weeks after application. Um, so possibly the, the 9994, because it was also good in the dormant trials, and the 9900, then that could be perhaps something more a dormant or an intero um, application looking at there, rather than over the crop, just to be kinder to it. And in the weed control, all treatments except curve flow stop aqua, uh, boot flow stop aqua, 9864, significantly reduced percent weed cover. And we've got uh, four treatments there, the wing people selector, um, wing pea and 9865 and the 9900, which actually gave better weed reductions in weed cover than the standard curve flow stump aqua on that particular weed, um, weed species selection in that trial. But one thing I said to know is tank mixes containing curb and 9900 do have activity on willow herb. So if that's a weed that's an issue, then that the 9900 gives something in the future for control of it, and for now, curb is something you consider in the mixes. So no, there weren't, and just to clarify, there were no significant effects on emergence bud numbers or flower quality from any of the treatments in the assessments earlier this year. Um, so this slide is just put together to give the key points, I think, from both trials that have been carried out over the last two years. I think, um, the authorization of metabromuron has been very useful and it's a safe alternative to linuron when tank mix with Senquex flow and or stop aqua. And then as we've seen, there's also Nirvana Hurricane and Wing P, which are safe in this trial and could be useful alternatives depending on the weak species we've got, but haven't trialed those in tank mixes. 
um, and I've only actually seen them once, so something to bear in mind. And then for the future, there's uh, three, three or four coded products which are worth considering um, and are in various stages, I think, of authorization, which Joe was to talk about. And in the post cropping, I think at the uh, Cornish trial on the Shepherd's Perth and Willow Herb, Wing P and Lecter gave better weed control than the Stomp Aqua Curve Flow, but Curve Flow is useful addition in there for the control of Willow Herb. And then you've got two more um, useful additions to consider for the future, which are coming through from these trials. And importantly, no detrimental effects were seen on any flowers in the following season. So I think we've got a number of useful combinations there which we can either take forward or use at the moment. And just sort of thank the grower host who hosted the trial. So Greenyard Flowers down in, in Cornwall and Taylor's Bolt in Lincolnshire, and then input from the agronomist and also the scientific staff who did all the uh, assessments for me on these trials, as well as HDV and ICAM that Dave sent for. And so I think it's over to questions. Thanks, Angela, and uh, thank you for persevering. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, any questions, please submit them. Um, we've just got a comment here saying that um, future flow is going and she could be earlier than EU dates suggest, so so it might yeah. be as early as the end of July. So that's obviously, yeah, up in the air. um, I was aware of that. Um, when I wrote the presentation, but I think when we actually designed the trials back in 2018-19, we knew yeah. it was uncertain, but I don't think we knew it would go quite so quickly. Um, but I thought I'd leave it in there if it gives people an option, at least for now. For now, yeah. The, the information there. Um, well, there's, there's a, I'm not sure how to interpret this. Um, what were the what were the soil type and moisture levels when apl when applied residuals? Okay, so I think in both situations it was damp to wet. Um, so yeah, November last year it was very wet, and I know the grower can actually get on the field around that trial. Um, we only really got on it because we can walk. And then in March the year before, that was also, there was good moisture. So it's good moisture when they were all supposed to fly. Okay, thank you. Um, it looks like, um, looks as though there are some good residual options. Do you see any new contact materials? Yeah, I think yeah, there is. Yeah. Okay. Um, any further questions or comments? If not, I will um, pass over to Joe to give us a um, drop crop protection update. Thank you very much, Angela. All right. Bye. Okay, so um, I'm Joe McTighe um, and I work on the EMU team for AHDB. Um, we've had a few changes on the EMU team recently. So I started with the AHDB a year ago. Um, Adam also started at, the, at a similar sort of time. Um, and a few months ago, we lost our manager, Valletta, and she's gone back to Denmark. And we are now managed by Joe Martin. And Joe has um, historically looked after weeds and looked after separate plus trials. He's also got a residues background um, and he will be taking on Valletta's crops, which are field veg and leafy salads. Um, so I look after ornamentals, which obviously includes narcissus, and I also look after protected edibles. Um, in addition, I come from an efficacy trials background and I have operator exposure training. I'm just going to run through what we do. A little bit as the EMU team. Obviously, we um, submit the forms to CRD for um, EMU applications and also emergency applications. Um, and to understand better what products we are able to take forward and to understand better which products are coming forwards, we meet with um, AgChem representatives um, every six months and we meet about 15 different companies in this way. And we might talk about uh, 
whether they agree with our email applications, we might talk about new products, um, and they also give us um, updates on where actives um, are in the approvals uh, status. The EMU team also look after residue trials, so this isn't really very uh, relevant for Narcissus, although I will mention it again later, but this is obviously relevant for um, edible crops. We meet with the regulator CRD very regularly, every six months or so, and have an open, open dialogue with them sort of on a more regular basis. Um, and we also talk with our EU colleagues who work in minor, in minor uses. Um, and we, ha we have something called the MUCF facility, and we meet twice a year, and that's actually coming up next week. And I sit on the ornamentals group for that. And we share information. Um, sometimes we share costs for residue trials, and then we also look at different projects together. So I'm going to run through where we are with different emus for um, ornamental plant production outdoors. Um, I'm not going to touch on every single one of these, but um, as we go through, I'll highlight a few. So these are the new approvals we've had since we last met. Um, and I've just highlighted that we are seeing these restrictions on timings, um, which obviously isn't great for narcissists. So these are um, products that we've had refused since our last meeting and heading that list is Mirage, um, which John was speaking about earlier. So the application for an emu for Mirage has been rejected. Um, and this was because um, of the problem with the amount of product on the bulb going straight into the soil. So there's no interception from leaves, which you would normally see um, from a, a, a crop protection product being applied to a plant. Um, and essentially, it, it was deemed that too much of the product from the bulb went straight into the soil. So I'll come back to that later in the, the options we've got around that. Um, we've also lost basimid from use for um, cut flowers outside. Um, initially, cut flowers were on the emergency application. These have had to been removed because we had to massively narrow the, um, the application to go in for an emergency authorization. So we had a meeting with CRD last week, and um, they sort of agreed that actually it's becoming more difficult to get emus through. Um, we're seeing obviously loss of actives. Um, we're seeing more products being frozen for a longer period of time whilst they whilst they go through the authorization process. And while they're in this frozen period, we can't apply for emus. When the products are reauthorized, sometimes we're seeing loss of on-label uses. Um, we're certainly seeing, so with the pyrethrins, for instance, we saw that loss of all edible crops or all non-edible crop labels, the, the labels are becoming more specific. Um, and we're also seeing changes to the risk envelopes on those envelopes, so the number of uh, applications that are possible and potentially rates are being lowered. And when we apply for an EMU, we can only apply within those label rates. Um, we're also seeing more worker exposure restrictions on the on the authorizations. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that ornamental crops have this huge transfer coefficient. So this is the amount of product that is, is seen to come off onto a worker when, it, when a worker brushes past. So for ornamentals, this is the, the coefficient is 14,000. For berries, it's 5,800. So you know we're working in, in a different place to potentially some of the other crops. Um, for narcissists, we also have an environmental risk issue because we're trying to apply during the drain flow period, which is October to April. This is when um, there's a lot of water around and um, drain flow into streams and water courses is, is, is modeled to be more excessive. And so it's harder to get products through during this period. Um, and again, we've got this 0% interception rate, which again, you've got a bulb with the product. If you're applying to the bulb, and the bulb goes into the soil, there is no interception from the leaves going into the soil. Having said that, we are still putting in applications, and these are the things we've got in with um, CRD at the moment. So we've got Lunar Privilege gone in just recently, um, and there was a lunar formulation in SP45 in the smolder white mold trial, so this will be useful. Going forwards. Um, so I'm just going to talk about diseases first. So these are applications that potentially we could progress. Um, 
Romeo has actually gone in since I wrote this slide, um, and that is now with the idea being looked at. So if you have any questions on any of these specifically, please do just email me after this event. And these are applications that we are considering. So the previous slide was, um, we've just finished our round of uh, meetings with the different ag chem companies. Um, and these are products that we have agreement to progress and take further. Um, and these are other products that maybe we've had some interest in, but, or have done well in SEPTA plus trials, um, but potentially we can't take them forward just yet and they're still in discussion. Um, and then at the bottom there, we've got um, Saccardis, um, which again was in the white mold smolder trial. And um, we do actually have an EMU for this, and I will just come on to that in a minute. We need to try and change the um, application dates on the EMU. So as I was saying before, um, John talked, Dave talked about um, white mold and smolder trial earlier. These were the results from year one. Um, and I just wanted to give you a quick overview of where we were with the products that were in that trial. So um, three of the uh, test products have actually got emus against them now. So that's proof cup, collectus, and saccardis. And as you can see from there, saccardis um, had a really good effect on severity and incidence for both white mold and smolder. And um, prolectus also had good impact on severity for both. Um, for the cafe, smolder in particular. The problem we have with these products, although we now have the authorizations for ornamental plant production outside, um, they have restrictions on their application dates, which make them potentially unusable for narcissists. So um, in particular, I'm going to look at Saccardis as, a, as an urgent one to look at and try and get those dates um, moved backwards. Um, as I mentioned before, there's two or three other products there which for which an emu is possible we're either in discussions about them or one of them has actually been um, submitted um, and then there are a couple of pro other products there so 9871 I think was the biological product that Dave was talking about at the moment this is only used um, under protection so um, bringing it into an outside environment might be difficult and then that other product here 9926 um, that's not actually being sold in the UK at the moment so so some potential hurdles to overcome there um, on to the fusarium bulb dip. Again, I just wanted to give you an overview of where we were with the with the um, the products that were in there. As John mentioned, there are a few products that came out that looked good. Um, so Storit XL, Mirage, and this 9819. Um, as you know, Prochloras Mirage has been rejected. Um, so I am looking at all three products again. So the reason it was rejected is because of this interception issue with the amount of product on the bulb being de deemed too high to go into the soil. So actually, John has now um, written his report up, and that includes information on bulb load. And when we submitted the Mirage application to CRD, they wouldn't actually accept this data um, because it wasn't published. Um, we are hoping, we are now in discussions with them to see, to see whether they will look at this data. Um, and this will hopefully enable them to remodel uh, the applications um, with a lower amount of product on the bulb. Um, we have got a couple of backup options if that doesn't work. We could look at how much the amount of product has degraded over time because obviously there's a storage period after after dipping so we can look at the, the rates of degradation over that storage time and if that's still not enough then potentially we could look at some residue trials so basically looking to see how much product is on the bulbs after storage. Um, so just to touch on weeds, again, we've got a few products that we have agreed that we can progress. Um, either the product or the active of each of these has been in SEPTA plus trials and has, has proved to be effective. So hopefully they will be useful. Um, and then there's just one insecticide there to take forward. This is actually the same as Flipper um, or very similar to Flipper. Tech Bomb is very similar to Flipper, um, which we've just achieved an EU for. Um, again, just a few more ones that are under consideration that we can't take forward at the moment. Um, and then there's a, just a few at the bottom there, which if you've got any interest in these, these are ones that we've been asked about, but um, if there is interest in taking them forward, do let me know. 
Um, just quickly to touch on um, active ingredient renewals. So this is what we've lost in 2020. So the products on the left, the list there, they, they have been lost and the grace periods are over, so they can't be used anymore. Um, and then on the right, we've got um, more, more recent product uh, active withdrawals. And I just wanted to draw your attention to bromoxanil because actually I had some correspondence from CRD last week, at the end of last week. And although the EU grace period is, has been set at the 17th of the 9th, 17th of September next year, CRD are considering uh, bringing forward this grace period, this use up period. Um, and they have asked that if there are any issues with this, that we 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 send in, in some information about that to them before they made that decision. Um, Mancazeb is a new one that has um, was lost in the October GOPAF meeting and thiophanate methyl. Again, we haven't got a use up period, but that was lost in September. These are products which potentially we're worried about next year that are coming up for renewal next year and for whatever reason um, are scoring a three in our AHTB active risk register, um, which means they're at high risk of being lost. As I mentioned before, we um, talk with CRD fairly regularly and we have a number of projects ongoing with them. So one of them is looking at the LTAEU uses um, and CRD have indicated that the LTAEU scheme won't continue indefinitely. Um, and so we sort of have an ongoing project to check products that haven't been taken over to an EMU already under this scheme and see if we, we are able to take more products over. Um, we are also looking at an interception um, project. So basically looking at ornamentals by morphology and trying to link them with um, crop types that have an existing BBCH growth scale. Um, so for instance, sunflower has BBCH growth scale and potentially we could link that with cut flowers. Um, and also just a warning that they are, well, not a warning, um, they're looking at a new label phrase for tillage. So um, they assume that a five cent, they assume a five centimeter tillage for their models. However, sometimes a 20 centimeter tillage is enables a product to be authorized where it might not be at five centimeters because of the greater depth of in, um, because of the greater depth um, which, with which the um, product is integrated. Um, so they're looking at whether they can add this 20 centimeter mitigation onto a label. Um, and again, if, if that would be a problem within Narcissus tillage um, pre-planting, then we can let CRD know that. And that's me for today. Um, if you have any questions, I don't know if there's a couple of minutes now, or otherwise, please feel free to contact me contact me by phone or email anytime thank you yeah we thank you joe um we do have some time if anyone has any questions to ask joe or um any of the other speakers um i've got one for joe um mm -hmm. what do you anticipate the impact of brexit will be on your work with emus um and you know future regulation of plant protection products in the uk yeah, so we've talked to CRD a little bit about what will happen next year. All of the regulations, all of the products, all of the actives, all of the MRLs, they will all be brought over into um, UK law. Um, and potentially after January, we might start seeing some divergence um, from the EU. Um, obviously, the CRD will then have all the authorization on whether actives go through. Um, CRD are a very good regulator within the EU. They have a lot of experience um, and they're very efficient. So we're hoping for maybe something a bit more streamlined. Um, but, you know, there are concerns with how much it's going to cost for chemical companies to register in both the EU and in the UK. So I know CRD are looking at their fee structure, so potentially that could have an impact on um, approvals. A follow-up question here, um, but aren't we not losing mutual recognition? 
yes, yes, we yes, we're losing the mechanism of mutual recognition. Um, so CRD are able to access a, data, a European database at the moment um, called CERC, CERC BC, um, and that allows them to access all the data that the, all the European regulators have have eyes on. Um, in fact, CRD have already lost this, um, and so aren't able to do haven't been able to do mutual recognitions um, this year. Um, we think a way forward is um, to obtain that data directly from the ag chem companies. Um, and submit it separately to, to the UK regulator to CRD. Um, in practice, we'll have to see how that works. But there is an indication that it, it, although mutual recognition will stop, there will still be a way of um, looking at what other countries have within the EU and potentially bringing them across as long as we can get hold of the data. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions for any of the speakers? Um, as I said, if you have anything that you think of after this webinar, please either contact um, individual speakers or um, send them in to me at natalie.kia.ahdb.org.uk. Um, John has a quick plea um, saying, um, he's happy to receive soil samples from growers with fusarium to help test um, the diagnostics that they're working on. So, so please contact John for that. So that's john.clarkson at warwick.ac.uk. Thank you, John. Um, in, in answer to your question, Jason, yes, um, this webinar has been um, recorded. So you will be able to look back to read and, and I can then provide you with uh, presentations as well. Um, so just to wrap up quickly, just thank you very much to, um, to Dave, to Angela, um, John and Joe for your presentations and also thank you to for everyone to dialing in. Um, sorry about some of the technical issues we had. Thank you for your patience. Um, as I said, please submit any further questions to me um, and we'll try and get those answered for you. And the recording will be made available hopefully within the next couple of weeks, um, put online. Um, and just to remind you as well, we've got a second webinar um, with more detail about the, uh, the chlorine dioxide work um, in hot water treatment on Thursday at 12.30. So please do um, register for that as well. So um, without further ado, thank you very much for listening um, and goodbye.